In the last video on requirements, we explained what requirements are and their importance. This time we're going to have a look at how requirements are generated, or as some people prefer, how they're captured. Uh, there's a constant debate about whether it should be called requirement generation, implying that there is an analytical examination of the purpose and the objectives to explore the requirements that are implicit within them. And requirement capture, implying that the requirements exist in the stakeholder world and they have to be hunted down. Well, in practice, there's a bit of both going on, but let's start with a series of methods that are definitely in the capture school of thinking, which could be characterised as direct contact with the stakeholders. Direct contact with the stakeholders is a rather obvious way to get their input. In its simplest form, it means going and asking the various stakeholders using questionnaires, interviews, which can be either structured or unstructured, focus group discussions and collecting data while an existing system is in use, a technique that is now very common practice in the computer industry. These techniques are generally more important for getting the requirements for stakeholders other than the direct customer, such as passenger surveys, or I saw a British Rail idea of high-speed filming passengers sitting in a railway train seat to see how they actually use the seat. These processes may find functional requirements. For example, a survey might show that 25% of all passengers on our Star Cruiser are Jedi Knights and they require a Kyber Crystal Rejuvenation System for their lightsabers, so it would be a good idea to fit one of those. But more typically, the most valuable information they provide will be interface and environment requirements. This is where you find out where and with what the real end users actually use the system. And these direct contacts often produce operational requirements. Notoriously, when the people who service the system are consulted, this became an increasingly serious issue with the sophisticated fighter aircraft in the later 20th century, which in operation were found to be requiring tens of hours of maintenance for each hour that they actually flew. So maximum operational maintenance time became an important stakeholder requirement. The problem with these direct contact inputs is that they are rarely in a form that leads directly to a requirement. The skill is in interpreting the raw data to extract the real issues and then finding the wording for a requirement that addresses it. This is particularly the case when we come to the human machine interface. Human beings are not always predictable. Knowing what a human operator will find easy to handle and straightforward to understand may require some trial and error on the designer's part. If this trial and error exercise is left out, perhaps because the designer thinks he has a clear view in his head of what he wants and has not bothered to try it out on an innocent bystander, confusion and frustration result. To this end, the idea of fast prototyping evolved. The Xerox Corporation faced this problem when they first started to think about copying machines that could be placed in the middle of the office for anyone to use. Up until that point, industrial copying machines had been big and complex devices that needed a trained operator to run and had their own department. Now what was needed was a machine that anyone could walk up to and with minimal instructions do their own copying. But what would such an intuitive control panel look like? If you've tangled with your recalcitrant copier recently, you may have your own opinions as to where, how well they achieved this. But one way would have been to actually build a selection of control panels and try them out on a lot of people and see which one worked best. But computer systems have been getting more capable at the time. So instead, Xerox developed a computer display that could be rapidly altered to test different possibilities. And in the process, they developed the WIMPs, the Windows icons, menus and pointer scheme that for computer displays that we're familiar with today. Modern fast prototyping approaches to human machine interfaces work essentially the same way. When a new aircraft or a large ship is being proposed, the control panel will be quickly mocked up with computer displays representative of what the operator may expect. These displays do not actually have to fly the plane or steer the ship. 
although in some instances they may be hooked up to a simulator to give realism. The main thing is to show how it might look and what you might be able to do. Potential pilots or operators are then invited to sit in front of these displays and try things out and make comments. Any difficulties that become apparent can then be quickly reprogrammed to make changes. And this continues until the customer is happy. And then that setup is the basis for the human machine interface setup. The requirement becomes, I want it to look like that. People sometimes talk about fast prototyping or rapid prototyping of hardware. This is not quite the same thing. Building and testing component hardware early is part of the development process to find out how particular design concepts work in the real world. This is not entirely unconnected to what we're talking about. Fast prototyping is a methodology that can be applied during all three of the design stages of the project life cycle. Indeed, its conception certainly assumes that it will be used in the system design and detail design phases, with the simulator evolving from a life-size mock-up in cardboard at the start of system design through to a complex working simulator somewhere in the detailed design phase. But it is also an option to start the fast prototyping in the requirement generation phase when aspects of the human machine interface are integral to meeting the objectives. An early example of fast prototyping happened during the development of the Apollo Lunar Module at Grumman Aerospace. The team were desperate to save mass and someone suggested they got rid of the seats and had the astronauts stand up to fly and land the spacecraft. It got rid of the mass of the seats and the windows got smaller so more mass savings. The team produced a cardboard muck-up to get a feel for the implications of what would happen if they did this. In one respect they were playing at flying the system. And that's the spirit of the third technique we want to draw your attention to, which is variously known as mission models or operational scenario studies. In these studies, we examine the missions that the systems will have to undertake to fulfill the purpose that it has, mission here being interpreted broadly. This is valuable for missions that have repeated complex missions like passenger aircraft shown here. The study team look at the various phases of the mission, identifying the requirements it generates, and that is all types of requirement. It can be conducted by following an existing system that is doing the same or a similar mission. Or you can simply try and imagine the mission on a step-by-step -step basis. And of course with computer modelling, a system can be taken through its mission in a virtual environment. For example, the use of flight simulators can prove valuable for military systems. A combat aircraft or helicopter can be simulated with a set of performance parameters balancing, say, manoeuvrability and armouring, and then they fly this in a virtual war game to see which balance works best. And let's face it, that sounds like a fun job to have. A whimsical thought struck me watching a documentary on the Boeing 747. It had a shot of a team of British Airways engineers, all kitted out in late 60s business suits, with a model of a 747 and a load of model ground support vehicles working out the aircraft turnaround procedures at the airport gate. It looked a lot like a group of grown men playing and desperately trying to make having fun look like serious work. The point here is that whether using mission models and fast prototypes to establish requirements or for more detailed design, for it to work you have to imagine yourself into the scenario and that is a lot like playing. And in some respects, that should be the attitude. The engineer should engage with the process and try as far as possible to treat it as real. So far, we have outlined a process whereby we take the objectives and purpose and explore them using the sorts of techniques we've just discussed to establish requirements, which, assuming they still meet the objectives, we can collect together in a document we normally call the system requirement specification. But that's not really enough. For example, as we prepare for this video, we are a little, well, OK, a lot behind the planned production schedule. I could really use a time machine about now. I could set its objectives. 
I could even write a pretty convincing requirement specification. Does that mean I can get a time machine to meet my need? Of course not. We do not even have the scientific understanding to know how a time machine might work, let alone the technology. So we need to establish that the technology for our system is available and therefore the requirement specification is technically feasible. But you do need to be careful here and have thought about the technology implications in the context of the system with its complexity and its emerging properties. It would be easy to dismiss a time machine out of hand. But here I have a sound recorder that is capturing my golden vocal performance for you, my adoring fans, and posterity generally. And it has a time machine built into it, if you need it, because it can be set so that when you press the record button, it captures the sound up to 10 seconds before you press the button. So if the sound engineer is a little dozy when the director shouts action, or in that interview with a former cabinet minister when he spontaneously starts to confess to the murder and subsequent embezzling of NHS funding, then the day is saved. So a professional sound recorder whose livelihood depends on not messing up has a legitimate need for a time machine to take him back a few seconds in some circumstances. And thanks to something called a pre-roll buffer, it is technically possible. The sound recorder is always listening and stores the last 10 seconds ready for when you press the record button. Which is an example of why there is a loop back to could the requirements be revised. If the requirement is expressed as the sound recorder shall be able to travel 10 seconds back in time, then the technical feasibility assessment is likely to be on your bike, Sonny. But if it were expressed as the sound recorder shall have a pre-roll buffer of 10 seconds, then the technical feasibility is now simply an issue of how big does the system memory need to be to meet this requirement. So Bob, we've got a problem here. We've got a set of requirements and we need to somehow assess whether they're technically viable. Um, so how do we find out make an assessment of that well what we generally do is we do a sort of gash system design a concept design that meets the requirements to show that there is a system out there that can meet the requirements That's right. so you know concept design proves compliance with requirements and a lot of the time uh, we do a lot of those and they wind up in the waste paper basket yes. until we find one that the customer likes yeah. um, and occasionally um, we get requirements to do non-compliant non designs. Uh, I don't know if you remember back in the late 1980s when we were working on space station studies, uh, ESA actually gave us a contract uh, to deliberately uh, come up with non-compliant designs and halfway through that uh, you looked across the desk at me and said are we being compliant with the customer's requirements on this one? Yes, well, uh, at least I was in line with the study objective. Yeah. <laughs> And, but 9 out of 10 studies, either way, are not going to, uh, to lead on to something useful. Um, they teach you a lot about what's coming up. Um, and the, when the 10th one comes up, it can be a bit of a shock. I had uh, somebody who'd been working for me for most of a year, I guess, uh, doing these little studies. And every one of them had wound up uh, being filed away. Thank you very much. And then one day uh, we had one of these that looked as though it was going to move on. And all of a sudden I had a very worried number two, uh, mm. uh, redoing all his sums to make sure it really did <laughs> do what he thought it would do. Uh, so you have to be aware that some occasionally get through. And when they get through, then the subsequent process can often lead to things which are not quite what it, it, we set out to do. Uh, the example, perhaps classic, is the way the space platform turned into MVSAT over, yes. uh, over a period of time, uh, of time uh, and different handling. Mm. Uh, the essential concept was still there, but what it looked like was nothing like the original. Yeah. Feasibility designs show through a system design that what is being asked for in the system purpose and the system requirements can be achieved in real life and at a cost that can be afforded and represents value for money. 
So what are they used for? Well, the first thing is, as the name implies, that showing that there is a system solution that can meet the requirements by having a design that can be shown to have all the necessary properties and in particular the emergent properties. This is the second component of the technical assessment, which is to assess how mature the technology is that the system requires and what technology research is required before proceeding to the next stage. This technology assessment aspect is particularly important in the concept stage before a full scale and expensive development programme is started. It is good practice to undertake a technology readiness review during both the concept study phase and the requirements generation phase to ensure that the project will not be taking unnecessary risks. But it's also good practice to do them at the system design phase to ensure that the subsystem and component requirements specifications of the actual design only ask for what is feasible and that the risk and likely development efforts are properly evaluated. The accepted scale for evaluating how much risk is involved in using a particular technology are called technology readiness levels or TRLs. They were invented in 1974 by NASA and were later adopted by the US Air Force, the European Space Agency and the EU Commission. And they're now widely used today in general engineering. The wording and terminology does vary. After all, not everyone launches their product into space. But this is a scale to assess the readiness of technology to be incorporated into a new system. It is a waterfall process taking new technology from wild, vague ideas dreamt up one in the bath through the university research that shows the idea can work. But at TRL4, which is hardware demonstration at a laboratory level, the university research is supposed to hand over to the industry for exploitation. Indeed, government and many other grant awarding bodies will not fund university activities beyond TRL4. The next stage is then approving the technology in a relevant environment and proving the technology within system context in a relevant environment. These are assumed to be undertaken by the industry that's going to exploit them. And this, of course, is an order of magnitude more expensive than a laboratory demonstration. And so a good many ideas fall at this stage. And this gap between TRL4 and TRL7 is often called the valley of death. Assuming the technology can get through the valley of death, then typically it ends up with a major established industrial player. It's a sad fact that the most common way large companies innovate is to buy up small startups that have got the technology through the valley of death and taken the risks. For at TRL7, when the technology is incorporated into a system and proven in the actual operating environment, it is normally regarded as feasible for use in a proposed system development. This is the first massive trap that project after project has fallen into. Just because the technology is assessed at TRL 8 or 9 does not mean that the development for your particular application has no technical risk. So always remember a technology reached level 9 on another system with different requirements and not your system with your requirements. And just because it worked on that other system does not mean that it will necessarily work on yours. NASA did an exercise on different projects to see how early investment in technology affected later program cost overruns. What they discovered was those systems with little early investment, perhaps because the attitude that we already know all about that, tended to have big cost overruns. 100% overruns were not uncommon. But those systems or subsystems that managed to invest up to 7% of the eventual total cost during the feasibility, because they had lower TRLs, tended to come in on budget and cause less issues. So the technology assessment, the TRL, is only one part of the planning of how to get that particular technology ready for the particular application that you have in mind. If the TRL of a technology you wish to use is below seven, what it tells you is A, that you have a risk and B, that you may have to include some TRL raising development work in that area. There is a second massive trap for the unwary 
which is a consequence of the definition of higher TRLs talking about subsystems and systems. And this confuses the feeble-minded into thinking that the TRL applies to the system or subsystem. Let's be clear, it applies to the technologies the system is using. So there will be hundreds, if not thousands, of relevant TRLs that apply to an aircraft or spacecraft. In my days at Reaction Engines, I had to suffer a seemingly continuous flow of smug ignoramuses asking what TRL Skylon was at, nearly always as a precursor to dismissing Skylon as unfeasible. If they were lucky, they would get a quick contentious lesson on what a TRL is and a curt request not to waste my valuable time in this universe with such idiotic questions. And if they were unlucky, well, that's what hospitals are for. There have been a few foolhardy souls asked me the same question about the scorpion. So let's just use that as an example of what I mean. Quite a lot of the scorpion is unarguably at TRL 9. All these units in this avionics box are existing units from suppliers. And indeed, in these cases, all but one of the by, are made by the United Kingdom, either by Surrey Satellite Technologies or MDA in Oxford. But if we look at the docking port alongside this box, this is a concept called the USIS, the Universal Space Interface Standard. And it is not something already on any vendor's shelf and would need developing. So what's the TRLs involved here? Well, they are also all at TRL 9. That is a technology that has been used in another operational system in the same environment. So does that mean there's no development effort required or no development risk that it will not work as intended? Well, of course not. It just means that the development work can concentrate on the design aspects rather than learning about the technology involved. Another example of the subtleties of TRLs would be the chemical engines, which on the Scorpion are scaled from a 1970s engine made by Rockadyne called the Advanced Space Engine. A test engine was built and tested, so that would make everything at least at TRL 6, but the majority of the technology involved here came from the Space Shuttle main engine, which of course is TRL 9. So is the Scorpion's engine's technologies at the same level? Well, it's been scaled by 6.5. So does the technologies involve scale? Well, maybe they do, maybe they don't. The technology technical readiness review would have to come to an opinion on that. And although Rockadyne had designs for two versions of the advanced space engine, one fixed thrust and the other throttleable, the one they built and tested was the fixed thrust version. But the one used as the basis for scaling was the throttleable version. So does that introduce new technologies or impact the proven range of the existing technologies? Another issue the Technical Readiness Review would have to come to an opinion on. And there's a final issue here. The TRL applies to America and in the 1970s and not to Britain in the 2020s. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there was a planet called Corellia, and that had all the technology at TRL-9 that was required to make a light freighter spacecraft not unlike the Scorpion, but with light speed capability and silly names like the Millennium Falcon. Does that mean I can assume these technologies in the Scorpion? Of course not. It is the level of technology available to the team that are going to build the system that matters. Well, we've rather laboured the use of TRLs because we've seen them so widely abused and misunderstood, but it brings us back to the role of feasibility designs, and here we have some guidance for you on what you should do when doing them. Our first piece of advice is that it should be conservative, using the lowest technology that can meet the requirements. If the design is conservative, then so are the key parameters that will be derived from it, most importantly cost. If this feasibility design is conservative, then the final design, which will be better optimised, uh, should have no nasty surprises in store as the project develops. Indeed, one would hope it should be substantially better. On the subject of optimisation, uh, there should be a rule of no trade-offs. A feasibility design should dig down into detail and not spread out. 
Um, it's in the detail that you find the problems and the hidden issues. Uh, and this is also where you learn about the system. Um, so we would argue that until you have done a deep, detailed feasibility design, you almost certainly do not know enough to perform a valid trade-off anyway. So trade-offs of a system design. I think this enables us to add a second reason to do feasibility studies. They help the team learn about the system. As a consequence, our third piece of advice is that once the requirement generation is over and you have requirement specification, then burn the feasibility design and in particular do not publish it with the specification. Actually, this is probably never possible in practice. If they're any good, your contractors and your competitors will know about your concepts and the estimated costs associated with them uh, as soon as you do. So the alternative proposal I once heard was to publish everything and then state the proposal that comes closest to this design automatically loses. You can see the consequence of showing the system design with what is now called the Orion spacecraft that will carry astronauts to the moon as part of Project Artemis. A long while back, NASA started concept studies with various contractors for a crew exploration vehicle capable of carrying humans beyond low Earth orbit. And these studies produced a variety of concept designs, although I suspect with no defined purpose or objectives. Then in 2005, it issued a formal request for proposal with a specification and a concept design. And what did he get back? Well, dead ringer concepts from competing teams, of course. After all, what company is going to risk something radically different with so much at stake? It's an interesting what if. What if NASA had released just the specification and the contractors had to come up with their own concept designs to meet it? Would we have had such uniformity then? And in the actual world, what we ended up with is the Orion capsule. Although, to be fair to NASA, when they asked for commercial systems to deliver crew and cargo to the ISS, they did not show any concept designs and therefore much better match up to the ideal we are suggesting here. And look at the variety of design concepts that have been produced as a result. So, I'm arguing here that the teams with the design authority should be free to determine the system design based on their trade-offs and other optimization techniques and in the end just simple engineering flair and they should ignore the concept and feasibility designs. When I produced this post-architecture design for a space station it was as a demonstration that the approach of multiple small space stations was a cheaper and more effective approach to in-orbit infrastructure development. I certainly did not intend it to be a blueprint to be slavishly followed and if the ideas were pursued I would not expect the end result to look anything like this. Thus one should expect the end product to have a very different design from the one that was produced at the start of the study. For example here is the original 1980 HOTOL concept produced by Bob Parkinson before it was even called HOTOL. A couple of the designs during the period when it was called HOTOL compared with Skylon, which is where the project ended up when reaction engines took it over. Um, Bob, when I was working for you in the uh, late 1980s, um, although I wasn't on the HOTOL team working on other things like the space stations we've mentioned, um, I was close enough to see what was going on and I was very impressed with what HOTOL was doing as a feasibility design and, and doing what a feasibility design should do. Would you, would you agree with that? Assessment? Yes. I mean, um, in fact, we learned an awful lot about how to do those things. Um, some of us are more experienced than others in, in doing feasibility design. And you've seen the shapes change in and, and, and so mm. forth. And the learning process was quite important. Mm. Um, we should emphasise that this is an area where we didn't have a lot of previous, no one had previous experience. Nobody had so, previous so we had to learn about uh, it, yeah. doing this and, and we, had, we had to learn by doing. Yeah. And um, to some extent it, it looked as though in um, 1989 
that the project had been unsuccessful and failed and mm. been closed down. And that wasn't actually true. First mm. of all, uh, we knew that we had a configuration problem yeah. uh, before that happened and essentially the direction it would need to take. And when Alan took it away and, and, and started with Skylon, mm. uh, that was effectively the next iteration. Yeah, I mean, Sky is an example of something that has learned from a feasibility yes. design to create a system design that that works. Yes, yeah. uh, and and it was quite interesting. The, the, the problem was a problem of maintaining an aerodynamic centre yeah. over yeah. a wide range of Mach numbers. And, and, and every project on single stage orbit yeah. ignores this at the start. <laughs> uh, I seem to remember you told me about a meeting where. Um, the aircraft, one aircraft man said, oh, I think trim might be a problem. And all the aircraft people said, oh, no, you know, we always solve trim. <laughs> and all the space people are going, what's trim, what's trim? And yes. when they're explaining to them, yeah, well, that's not very important, is it? And, and of course, and, the one guy was right. And, and he was right. And that um, eventually, uh, at the same time, watching other people's proposals oh, for similar yes, sorts yes. of projects, you could tell how far they got by the fact they'd not actually mentioned that particular problem yes. yet. And you knew that eventually it would be a major problem and effectively kill programs it kill yes. the x33 for instance yeah um and I, I, and also the, the one i worked on mm. the delta clipper which was bidding mm. for the x33 mm. program yeah. they discovered it and did their configuration change mm. just as they were bidding to nasa so yeah. nasa thought oh they don't know what they're doing they're changing their configuration yeah. but actually this was a signal that they did they were doing yeah. yes uh again there's an exercise to the readers look at any single stage orbit proposal, you will spot a major configuration yeah, change when right. that dawns on people. And you also, uh, despite the fact that the project uh, gets terminated, the, that learning carries on in terms of capability and technology mm -hmm. afterwards. And so out of the hotel program, there were a number of interesting uh, pieces of work that, that pers persist to this day. Um, That's within British aerospace. Within British aerospace, um, the uh, uh, one of the things we did was to develop software that would do complicated technology uh, trajectory analyses, mm. uh, which is still being used to put spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter. Mm. Um, metal matrix composites mm. uh, were highlighted within the program and became something that is now. Uh, you can go out and buy components in metal matrix composites. Yep. Um, there are a series of these things. Yep. And in fact, to some extent, the system design process, which we'll show you in a later lecture, is a consequence of HOTOL. Mm -hmm. yep. um, yeah. So let us assume that we've discovered some of the technology we need to realize the objectives as a low technology readiness level. How do we deal with this? Remembering to reach past the valley of death, we need technology proven in the context of a system operating in a representative environment. The way this is often achieved is to build experimental technology demonstrators, such as the Mars 52 we saw in the last video, or the NASA USAF series of X-planes. Most engineering industries have test projects of some sort to explore technical aspects of the design. For example, the car industry has concept cars. The higher the technology level exploited, the more important such demonstration projects are. You can see the role of these demonstrators in the Eurofighter development program. Between 1981 and 1984, a modified Jaguar aircraft was used to explore the technology of active control of an aircraft with unstable aerodynamics using fly-by-wire technology. This gave British Aerospace the confidence to incorporate this technology into their proposed new Ajaf combat aircraft. Note that this technology demonstrator looks nothing like a Eurofighter and that the test programme was carried out well before the funded programme was started. This aircraft is now on display at the RAF Museum at Cosford, and while it may not look like a Eurofighter, the plane behind it does. But that isn't either. It's an aircraft called the EAP Experimental Aircraft Programme, and it was made by British Aerospace. It looks like a Eurofighter because it's proving the system design. But it's not exactly the same. For example, the tail is from a tornado and larger than the final design. 
but it's enough like it to prove the design and provide information for final improvements before entering the detailed design. Its role is to reduce risks and learn lessons for the final design. In this case, the EAP was early in the system design process and was a bit of a hybrid as it was sneaking in bits of experimental technology development, such as the carbon fibre structural elements. System demonstrators are expensive, typically about a tenth of the cost of the final aircraft. But in this case, it seems to have worked. An assessment by the House of Commons Accounts Committee concluded that the, the under £100 million programme has saved a year on the schedule and about £850 million on the Eurofighter's development cost. The idea of a system demonstrator is perhaps better seen in the United States Air Force fighter aircraft procurement process. The United States has several companies that could realistically make fighter aircraft and the Air Force have enough money to fund more than one system design. So after they have finalised their requirements, two competing companies produce two system designs and build two system demonstrators and then compete in a fly-off contest for the final contract. That happened in 1990 when two system demonstrators, the YF-22 and the YF-23, flew against each other for the advanced tactical fighter contract. The F-22 won because although slightly slower and having a larger radar cross-section, it was more agile leading to the F-22 Raptor. What makes these different from a technology demonstrator is that they are proving the technology in the application. So these aircraft are not proving stealth technology works, they are proving they can meet a radar cross-section requirement with their design. This is why they're called Y-planes. They are different from and after X-planes. Another key point here is that two very different system designs meet the same requirements. And that can be seen again 10 years later when there was another fly-off competition between the Boeing X-32 and the Lockheed Martin X-35 to win the Joint Strike Fighter project. Two very different designs with different technologies and different assumptions about manufacturing but meeting the same set of requirements. Lockheed Martin won and the result is the Lightning II. Note in this case they misnamed them with an X-plane designation. An X-plane was supposed to be a technology demonstrator whereas these are design demonstrators and should have been designated the YF-32 and the YF-36 which rather indicates that the collective mind of the US Air Force has forgotten the distinction between the two things. What these technology and system demonstrators are not are prototypes. A prototype comes at the end of the detailed design phase and is made to the flight production drawings, but not necessarily on the production tooling. And here is the first of the Eurofighter prototypes. And its job was to be the final step in proving that the Eurofighter design meets its requirements. Once the design is proven, then the production line can start to make the operational aircraft. So to recap, there are three kinds of test system used during development programmes. Experimental or technology demonstrators that are used to explore and understand particular technologies and raise their TRL in the pre-project or requirement generation phase. Then there's demonstrators or system design demonstrators. These are used to demonstrate features and performance of the proposed system in the system design phase. And finally, there are prototypes or pre-production models which are built to flight drawings to verify that the complete design in the detailed design phase meets the requirements and it's part of the system's qualification. So we've established the requirements and found that, that technically they can be met. Then there is one more job to do before we can move on to the next phase. We know what we want and we know how it can, that it can be got. But how much is it going to cost? Can we afford it? In practice, we're going to need a bit more than that. We're going to need the complete program plan, and in particular, the detailed planning for the next phase. But we need something to base that on, 
And that brings us to the third function of the feasibility design. Although the feasibility design is not the final design, it's the best we have at this stage, and it should be close enough to provide safe costing consumptions. So it's the feasibility design that allows us to get a first estimate of the costs involved. It may seem rather early to get an estimate for costs at this rather hypothetical phase, but as you shall see in, in a later video, there are techniques for getting values, perhaps not precise values, from the very earliest stages. This can be done because we can compare with known costs from completed programs, which are similar enough to be a good basis. A process known as parametric modelling uh, is used and it's important enough to merit a separate video. This early cost estimate is important for a number of reasons, for planning later phases, for supporting the sales bid at the next stage, but also because it tells us something of how much we should be investing in getting the required technology ready. And this is where our advice about keeping the feasibility design conservative should pay off. It means that the cost estimate should also be conservative. For now, we've reached the end of the requirement generation phase and we're almost ready to proceed to system design. But to start that, we need somebody to cough up money and that can take some persuading, which brings us to the last of the feasibility design's purposes. And that means selling it. There is an adage which says, a bad idea with a good presentation will fall eventually. A good idea with a bad presentation will fall immediately. The point being that what we need is a concrete design that can be used to sell the system. Give people a focus as to what the system is about. Bob, I remember in the uh, mid 80s, when decisions were being made about the European involvement on the space station, the BAE had a poster made up of your proposal for a space platform. And now, given that we were trying to sell this to a notoriously anti-space UK government, uh, how do you think this poster helped you? Right. Yes, there, there's a particular point um, in, uh, in the process of this. Uh, the minister um, uh, got a, uh, organised a conference yep. of all the interested parties, uh, a sort of national debate. I didn't know at that point what a national debate was. What it meant was getting everybody into the same room yep. and seeing whether they had the same opinion. Uh, we had done work. The, we, I'd talk, been talking to the interested parties and we, mm. uh, um, we knew people we got on our side. Um, but the meeting was the important thing. Yep. That was where, where it got to the minister. Mm. And uh, because Space Platform was one of the options, then mm. I was there to speak about Space Platform. Mm -hmm. uh, immediately in front of me uh, in this debate uh, was one of the directors of Logica mm -hmm. who gave a fairly thorough and detailed um, presentation on the things we ought to be taking into account yeah. in making the decision. Um, it, it went on for some time, but it was fairly thorough and, and knew what he was yeah. doing. Uh, but everybody had watched this in, in silence. At the end of it, or fallen asleep, probably. Or fallen asleep, probably. At the end of it, I came on, put up the picture, and said, "This is what we want to do." Yeah. And at that point, it was sold. Yeah. At that point, anybody who wasn't voting for it should leave the auditorium. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we so that point one out, single point. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, we should point out though that this wasn't just some some artists are knocked up. No. It was a proper feasibility yes. design. As you say, you'd already done a little bit of scoping around yes. immediate stakeholders to show they were meeting. Yeah. Um, but of course it evolved quite a bit after that. Yes, and because once, once the programme was sold, we'd been working by ourselves with the stakeholders in the UK. Yeah. It then became a European programme, other mm. people got involved, different uh, aspects were done. So yeah. the next time we did it, it didn't look like that at all. Because wider stakeholder community, mm. plus the fact I suspect the stakeholders you'd come, were taking it a lot more seriously yes. because it was a funded mm. programme. Uh, so that's one so that, so that changed it, and it changed again. It, it, this is not a quick project. It's something yeah. that uh, took seventeen years between getting yes. that picture and yep. getting something in orbit. Yep. Um, but uh, essentially, that was a key one view graph presentation that made the project possible.
Well, that brings our discussion on tools available during requirement generation to a close. We've looked at several methodologies and some are also applicable to, to the pre-project concept study phase and some spill over into the later system design phase. Which techniques are used and the amount of effort put into each will depend upon the industry and the project. But the fundamental goal is to capture all the stakeholder requirements and encapsulate them in a way that is economically feasible and technically feasible to realise. What catches most people by surprise is just how much effort is needed in this requirement generation phase. It should cost between 5 and 10% of the total development budget. So if a programme is a billion dollar development, you should be investing 50 to 100 million in the requirement generation and be prepared to throw that money away if the outcome of the feasibility assessments are not favourable. The most common problem is underinvesting in the requirement generation, which means the project has neither the proper foundation nor a complete understanding of its implications. There is one final methodology we want to cover called functional analysis, which is a way of handling and analysing functional requirements, bridging the gap between a stated requirement and the system designed to meet it. And we'll be looking at these in the next video.